I'm delighted to introduce our next awardee who, uh, for the uh, Goldman Rakich Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Cognitive Neuroscience, uh, named after Pat Goldman Rakich in, in her memory, who was a member of our scientific board and a distinguished, more than distinguished, a neuroscientist who was unfortunately taken way, way before her time in, in, in an accident a number of years ago. The recipient of this award uh, is our first American board uh, uh, presenter and awardee, uh, and is actually aptly uh, has another connection to Thomas Detry, whom I mentioned before uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. He, in fact, is the uh, Thomas Detry uh, chair, Professor and Chair of Neurobiology um, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh Brain Institute. Um, I'll just say a couple of words and get out of the way. He was a native of, he's from Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia, uh, was uh, educated at the University of Pennsylvania and went to, to Syracuse and also to SUNY Downstate uh, before uh, again going to the um, University of Pittsburgh where he's, where he's had a number of major leadership uh, positions which I will not uh, waste his time going over uh, but I'm really looking forward to what you're going to tell us about cognitive neuroscience, Dr. Strick. Thank you. I'm uh, deeply honored to receive the Pat Goldman Rakesh Award. Uh, Pat was a, a dear friend and a giant in the field of neuroscience. And so it's a, a deep honor for me to receive an award that bears her name. So, what I want to talk to you today about is the brain-body connection. The circuits that enable the brain, and in this case I'm just going to focus on the cerebral cortex, to influence the body and the organ I'm going to talk about is the adrenal medulla. Um, I couldn't do the work without uh, great assistance from colleagues, uh, support from NIH, and some initial very important support from this foundation. So every textbook includes a diagram like this of um, the autonomic nervous system influencing all the internal organs in our body. We think about the sympathetic nervous system as being involved in fight and flight and also the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, and, and those are oversimplifications. Um, but the internal organs inform the brain, and there's a great deal of interest in the, how the microbiome influences brain activity. And we're all aware of gut feelings and heart palpitations, and we think about this as interception. But we don't normally think about how the brain influences the body. And what I'm going to talk about is how the cerebral cortex influences the adrenal medulla, our first responder in times of stress. And uh, this is really a black box. These diagrams show the nerves coming out of the spinal cord and going to organs, but they don't show what the brain does, the internal workings of this. And there's a very simple reason for this, and that's an experimental challenge. These circuits involve multisynaptic connections. And how do we trace these multisynaptic connections? And we developed a technique of using rabies virus as a transneuronal tracer. So you can inject virus into a muscle or an organ, and it will be transported back into the central nervous system. Rabies is a live virus. It will replicate in the cells that it labels, and then have the special feature of moving transneuronally from one neuron to the next in a time-dependent fashion, so that we can label after the first-order neurons, second-order neurons, and then third-order neurons, and even fourth-order neurons. 
And the virus will essentially march through the brain in a very time-dependent fashion. Now, uh, you might think that rabies would just be disseminated throughout the brain, and how could you make any sense out of this? But in fact, it moves only through synaptic connections. So here's a slice of the brain where we've injected a single muscle and allowed the virus to go five synaptic connections. And you can see that the virus is located in very specific sites that are synaptically connected to the injection site. And now I'm going to enlarge this region and, and show you that the neurons there um, are, are labeled, um, their processes are labeled, and the red neurons here are unlabeled neurons. And what you should see here is there's no tissue but damage. When someone dies of a rabies infection, their brain looks visibly normal. It's remarkable. We still, to this day, don't know exactly what rabies does to the brain and how it makes it dysfunctional. But the property of not causing any cell damage, any cell lysis, means that we can study these neurons and, and chart them and map their synaptic connections. And so we can use this approach, inject a limb muscle, and work out the connectome for voluntary movement. We can inject a laryngeal muscle and work out the connections that are responsible for vocalization and language. Inject the heart and look at the brain's control over the cardiovascular system. Inject the summit and look at the GI system. The spleen, look at the brain's influence on the immune system. And what I'm going to talk to you about is injections of the adrenal medulla and how it reveals the connectome that underlies stress and depression. So in a sense, I'm interested in working out the brain's wiring diagram. And that's what we're able to do with this technique. So I'm going to make two points. And the first is that there are three cortical networks involved in the control of the adrenal medulla. There's a motor network, there's a cognitive network, and there's an affective network. And the second point I'm going to make is that these networks really are responsible, uh, proposing that they underlie the neural substrate for psychosomatic disorders. So this is the point where I can lose all of my audience. So I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to go to sleep. I'm going to show you brain diagrams. And brain diagrams are just an easy way of uh, summarizing some knowledge. So let me give you an example. So here's a, a map of landfills in the United States. And right away, you can see some very important points about where landfills are. It's a convenient way of summarizing data, of putting data in, in context. It's a map. I'm going to enlarge the map to show you the Northeast. And, and by the way, landfills are just another way of uh, saying garbage dumps. Um, I'm having a difficult time advancing this slide. So if you could advance the slide for me. Next slide. OK. So here's garbage dumps in the Northeast. And uh, this is where I live, in Pittsburgh. And you can see right in the middle of a whole bunch of garbage dumps. And I have a son who lives in Portland, Maine. Where does Maine send its garbage? And you guys know on this map where Manhattan is. And where does Manhattan send its garbage? OK, it's a very populated place. There are very few garbage dumps in Manhattan. It's obviously, they're sending it to Pittsburgh. All right? <laughs> so this map is a very good way of showing you information. Now, here is a map of the brain, all right? It's a flattened map of the frontal cortex of a monkey. And all I want you to see is that there's this gray area, and these are where all the motor areas are. And they have abbreviations. You could think of this as New York State. That's where the primary motor cortex is. And there are other cortical areas as well. And then these areas, I'm colorblind, so this looks blue to me. Um, this region is where medial prefrontal cortex is, areas involved in cognition and affect. That's all you need to know. And so here the red squares are the location of neurons in the brain, in the cerebral cortex, that influence the adrenal medulla. It took a chain of five synaptic connections to label these neurons. Uh, but their locations show you something important. We injected an adrenal medulla on one side, and it labels uh, cortex on both sides of the brain. And 
if you look here on the contralateral side, this gray area is where all the motor areas, and you say, look, there are a whole lot of uh, neurons here in the motor areas that influence the adrenal medulla. And then if you look in this hemisphere, well, there's a whole lot here, not in the motor areas, but in cognitive and affective areas that influence the adrenal medulla. So right away, you know, motor and cognition have an impact on your first responder in stress. So now let's just focus in on the motor areas. And I put little circles here around the cortical motor areas. You have multiple cortical motor areas. When you move, they determine the, the preparation, movement sequences, the preparation for action. It shouldn't come as any surprise to you that when you prepare to move, particularly fight and flight, that you uh, have some housekeeping details to take care of, redistributing blood to active muscles, and you also uh, energize your adrenal medulla. And so now let's just focus in um, just on the lateral surface. And now this is the primary motor cortex. And there's a map of the body. There's a face, arm, and leg representation. And if you look at where most of the neurons are, um, they're in the axial body representation, the region of the body that controls upright posture, your core. So my sons have told me for years, Dad, your job's tough. You ought to exercise your core. That'll reduce stress. And I said, I don't have time in my day for this baloney, guys. Um, <laughs> and now I do this experiment, and I see most of the neurons that are innervating from the motor areas are in my core, and I see, um, have a personal trainer that I see twice a week. Uh, right? <laughs> then you look here, there's another part of the motor cortex that influences your adrenal medulla, and it's the face representation, and particularly around regions that are involved in the muscles of facial expression. So all of you have heard, oh, well, let a smile be your umbrella, that if you smile, it has some impact, over your attitude and how you feel. Well, here what I can show you is that this region that's involved in controlling facial muscles has a connection to your adrenal medulla. So what I want to give you a sense of is that by looking at these connections, we get some insight into function. So now let's look in the ipsilateral hemisphere where we have all this cognitive labeling. And now I'm going to just focus on the medial wall of the hemisphere, and I'm going to flip it over. This is the way most human studies do it. And then because I'm colorblind, I'm going to color the areas, color code them. And so the, there are yellow areas that are involved in motor control. There are red areas that are involved in uh, cognitive control. And then there are these blue areas that are involved in the control of affect. And in the monkey, you can see cortical areas that one for one match what we have in humans. So there's a supplementary motor area in the monkey, and the human has a supplementary motor area. And I'm not going to go through these names, but what I want you to see is that there are motor control areas in the human that we have in the monkey. There are cognitive control areas that are present in the human that we have in the monkey. And then there are these affective control areas that we also have in the monkey. And then with human imaging studies, How's that? Great. So, um, If you look at the activations that occur with negative affect, you can see they fall in many of the same areas that we've shown uh, project to the adrenal medulla. So it's no surprise if you feel badly, it has some impact on regions of your internal organs that are involved in control of stress. Um, cognitive control structures are cortical areas that are activated when you have to resolve conflict. If you have two choices, and you're unclear which one is the best choice, and you think about that, it turns on these cognitive control areas, and you say, well, this is stressful. Well, in fact, um, 
this region that's involved in cognitive control has a connection to your adrenal medulla and has an impact on stress responses. Then uh, this area here is where Helen Mayberg, Andrew Susano, and others have been stimulating successfully to treat drug-insensitive depression with deep brain stimulation. And what we show is that this region has a connection to your adrenal medulla. And in this area, my sons have told me that I should be involved in the mindful meditation. And I, this is just much too much nuts and granola for me. And yet, um, these are the sites that are active during mindful meditation, and our results show that it has a connection to the adrenal medulla. So what have we shown here? We've shown that cortical areas that are involved in how you move, think, and feel have an impact on your first responder in times of stress. And so, in a sense, what I'm trying to indicate is that anatomical connections give you an insight into function. And my argument is that look at the definition of psychosomatic. It's uh, from Google of a physical illness or other condition caused or aggravated by a mental factor such as internal conflict or stress. And the example they give is her doctor was convinced that most of Edith's, why not Edward, problems were psychosomatic. And then I think this part is the one that gets me the most. This, the synonyms are all in the mind, psychological, irrational, stress-related, stress-induced, subjective, subconscious, unconscious. So what our data shows is that how we move, think, and feel, those cortical areas that control those actions and emotions and, and thought processes have an impact on organ function and potentially psychosomatic illness through actual neural connections that these illnesses are not irrational or imaginary. Instead, they're real. They are all in your head because your brain is in your head. And now I want to go to uh, Harry Potter uh, for a great insight here. Uh, tell me one last thing, said Harry. Is this real or has this been happening inside my head? Of course it's happening inside your head, Harry. But why on earth should that mean that it's not real? Thank you. Wonderful. Questions for Dr. Strick? Yes, yeah, wait in the back? Oh, so, yeah, so some, some I have a, Okay. So, so my question is, do you think these are all second order neurons or do you think you're going further back? Because you told us at the beginning that you can go, f you know, fourth, fifth order neurons. So, um, do you think this is a direct connection, I would assume, probably to, to the PNS, or is it further down, or, or more connections within the brain, basically? Yeah. So, some of these connections are as close as third order. That's a chain of three synaptically connected neurons. Um, but the, the neat thing about the technique is that since we inject an organ, we're really functionally tagging these neurons. So any neuron that's labeled, we know it has something to do with control of the adrenal medulla. Then we've done studies where we've looked at third order, then fourth order, then fifth order, and sixth order. And it's remarkable that when you get to the cortex, the regions that are labeled at fourth order are the same ones that are labeled at fifth and sixth. And so these are really central nodes. They're real hot spots that I talked about. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Carmen Andrescu from Pittsburgh. I'm a great fan of your work, uh, Dr. Strick. Um, my question is um, whether you can comment a bit on bidirectionality when your son sends you to the gym uh, and your core gets activated. How does that influence the brain regions that end up having all these effects on the rest of your yeah, body. Yeah, that's a great Thank question. You. Terrific question. So uh, I can give a direct answer because we've looked at the stomach. And we all know we make gut decisions. 
And they say, well, you know, it's the gut that's informing the brain. But what we've seen is that the region of the brain, uh, particularly the insula, that influences the gut is the same region that is influenced by the stomach. And so there's no way of disambiguating them. You know, your gut decisions are informed by your brain, just as they're informed by your gut. Yes, sir. Any psychosomatic disorders which you have in the removing from the list of psychosomatic disorders in the last 30 years? No, um, I'm more impressed by the impact of mindset, its broad impact. There's a wonderful study by uh, colleague Alia Crum, where she gave um, injections for allergy shots in subjects. And she had the nurse who gave the injection uh, wear a tag that said she was an expert and also <laughs> connect with the patient. And she measured the size of the allergy response. And then she had the same nurse read another script and show trainee, <laughs> and not really interact. And the impact on the size of the allergy response was remarkable. Wow. So I'm much more impressed with the impact that the brain has on organ function. Great. Okay. That was really fabulous. Thank you.